There are several bills that would seek to make major changes in tax policy in Ohio. Republican-backed measures in the House and Senate would eliminate one of the state's main sources of income, the personal income tax, and erase what had been the state's chief business tax, the commercial activity tax. All told, based on current numbers, this would be a cut of around $13 billion. And a few bills would make changes in property taxes, as homeowners are seeing tax bills with huge increases. Democratic Representative Dan Troy suggested a House committee to look into property tax law changes in the previous General Assembly. A joint committee of the House and Senate was formed in the state budget, and Troy is on it. On this issue for homeowners, it's the value of their homes and what they're paying and what they're willing to increase through levies. And then schools and communities, it's whether they can pass levies and money issues. And if they don't, what impact it's going to have on the schools and on the services those communities provide. So how do you address these dueling concerns here? Well, I think one thing that the state has over the years passed a lot more of the obligations for some of these services back to the local level. Uh, if you recall years and years ago, uh, our mental health system was a lot of state institutions, our development and disability uh, uh, programs were state institutions, but we moved those to the community level, which certainly made sense. Uh, it, it's a much better system, all that, but the money never followed. Uh, so we put more of the burden on local entities to fund those things. Uh, and it, I can remember talking to my Adams Board people and they were saying, 20, 30 years ago, 75% of their money was coming from the state line item. Now maybe only about 25%. So there's more pressure uh, for these local services. Obviously, the state is moving to a fair school funding formula, but uh, you know we really need to try and pick up more of the burden so there's less uh, demand on local property taxpayers for that. But somehow we have to disconnect the fact that because your property values go up, which is good, it's a good return on your investment, your property taxes should not go up commensurately because uh, you don't necessarily have the wherewithal to pay that. And, and but they don't right now. I mean, House Bill uh, 920 does keep that from being the case. It does in some cases. It does in certain cases, uh, except there are three exemptions. Uh, there's the inside millage, 10 inside mills. Those are not subject to 920. Uh, any the 20 mil floor on schools is not is not subject to 920 and in a city if you have charter millage charter millage is not subject to 920 also uh, because uh, that that can grow with that so I've asked legislative service is there a way we can lift a little bit on 920 so that there is a little bit of inflationary growth because that has been a complaint from the schools I can't get any more money that's why I have to go back to the voters again allow some inflationary growth but somehow extend that lid or that cap to things like inside millage and 20 mil floor millage and charter millage to allow some growth but not allow windfall growths uh, you know that are real burden on the taxpayers and all that and unfortunately LSC is saying it's a combination of constitutional changes or statutory changes so I think that's one of the things the committee has to sort out but uh, I, I think we have to realize that uh, uh, property taxes unlike income taxes which some of my colleagues have said let's get rid of the state income tax uh, we've had a graduated income tax in this country since 1913. It's a fair method of taxation because if you make more money, you pay a little bit more. If you don't make that much, you're not burdened as much. Property taxes does not address that. Uh, you can be property rich and income poor. And so what we really need to do is kind of keep those those tax revenues coming in at the state level, but use a lot of those dollars to buy circuit breakers for people on their property tax. Dra drastically increase the homestead exemption, help those people that have difficulty to pay. And, and we can do that with state money, but we can't do it if we're just going to basically uh, jettison a lot of this state revenue. I mean, so so I'm, I'm hopefully that we can, you know, look at that and say, let's let's bring property tax relief and let's bring tax relief to those that really need it. There are a couple of bills that would do some of that targeted tax release or, or temporary quick relief in a way. You've got House Bill 187 providing three years of property right. tax relief for seniors, 263 a property tax freeze for homeowners right. over 70 making under $70,000 in income, the 70 under 70 right. plan, uh, 274 another homestead tax exemption for certain long-term homeowners. Mm -hmm. But Senator Bill Blessing, who's the co-chair of this committee, which by the way, this was your idea, this committee, yep. mm -hmm. um, he has said that uh, there might be a problem in making these short-term changes when really long-term issues need to be addressed. And he's mm -hmm. worried about the impact of these short-term changes. So how do you get quick 
relief for homeowners who were looking at their tax bills now and saying, I can't afford mm. this or I'm concerned. Well, I think and that was one of the purposes of the committee is, first of all, the first part of it is education. First of all, we have got to understand how this system works. We need to educate ourselves, uh, the public, as to how this system works, and then figure out, you know, what is the fairest method to do that. We should not do it piecemeal. We should basically say that, uh, uh, you know, we're going to create a permanent uh, inflationary increasing uh, circuit breaker for those people who are struggling and want to remain in their homes but really don't have the wherewithal to, to uh, uh, you know, address their property tax burden. I think we can also impact on the spending side that property tax burden by the state maybe picking up a little bit more and stop shifting more and more responsibility back to the local governments on some of these very important programs that are very contributory to what we consider a civilized society uh, and also uh, maybe take a look at as i've said before and i co-chaired a commission about 12 years ago on local government reform and collaboration maybe we need to look at some consolidation or some uh, streamlining of a lot of our local governments to say uh, let's not keep trying to fund the service model the way it exists today Maybe let's change the service model to reflect the realities of the fact that we just can't keep banging on people for more and more property taxes. That's interesting because that's an idea that uh, former Republican former Governor John Kasich talked about when he was cutting the local yep. government fund, is streamlining local government and consolidating services. And here you're talking about yeah, that. Yeah, well, I, I just think it makes, I mean, I'm, I'm a consider myself a conservative Democrat, but I've said that the problem with so many governments is that there's so much overhead in the government. You gotta have a director, you gotta have a payroll person, you gotta have a legal counsel, you gotta have an office, you gotta have a HR person and all that. And all of that overhead is not getting any services to the citizen out there. We need to maybe consolidate some of that overhead into more centralized approaches so that we can get more dollars out there on the front line to provide the services that the citizens really need. The property tax burden has shifted dramatically away from businesses and commercial taxpayers to residential and agricultural taxpayers since 1975. Then residential property made up 48% of the school's tax base. Now it's 72%. That's a result of zeroing out the tangible personal property tax. And uh, that's on businesses. There are also exemptions, like $9 billion worth of exemptions that uh, are offered by local governments. The state mm -hmm. also offers some uh, exemptions as well. Uh, Senator Blessing has said he's concerned about that, but that seems to be the way that Republicans in particular have talked about keeping business here right. and bringing business here. Other states have these incentives. We have to do them too. Well, as I said in this morning's uh, committee, uh, we had a meeting. I said, now let's go back to what enterprise zones were. Enterprise zones were Ronald Reagan standing in the middle of the South Bronx in the 1980 campaign saying, we need some sort of government program that creates economic opportunity in an area like this that normally would not happen to, uh, to allow economic opportunity for the citizens who live in an area like this. And they, these things should really be, be reined in so that they, they all have to meet the but-for doctrine. But for the existence of this tax abatement, uh, this economic development cannot happen. I, I think right now these things are they, these things should be used in extraordinary circumstances. They are used across the board. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, you know they're used in areas that really aren't struggling and so. So yes, we definitely have shifted. So many property taxes are going to be paid, but what has happened here is more and more of those property taxes have been shifted to the homeowner's burden and less and less to the business concerns. I mean, I think somebody said 21% of the business property in Ohio is exempt from, from property taxes. And so I, th I think we really need to, and all of the county auditors that came in from around the state to testify, Democrats and Republicans all said that is a significant problem. The amount of money that is removed from our taxable base certainly requires us to be a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, demanding on, on homeowner property taxes. The upshot of all that is pretty much that taxpayers, more as more taxpayers are exempt, that makes a smaller pool of taxpayers who pay, and therefore they're paying more, right? Yeah, that that's the case with any taxation. You know, I mean, it's like when when I, you know, we're we're starting to. Uh, 
uh, what concerns me about getting rid of the state income tax and getting rid of the commercial activities tax is I, I've been doing government for a long time and I like a diversified revenue stream so I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket and if we start putting all our eggs in one basket you know we're, we're going to be very dependent on that so I think what what you have to do is you have to make sure that the you know the application of the taxation is uniform and as fair as possible i think that is i mean nobody nobody likes taxation everybody hates taxation but unfortunately if we want to provide the services that we consider essential to a civilized society we're going to need some level of revenue to to do that and i think uh, it, it's imperative upon us to make sure that we do that as fairly as possible. And then we make sure the load is, nobody's overburdened, but make sure nobody's underburdened. There was a question about that that specifically talks about, uh, have the costs of services gone up as much as property taxes have? And, and can local entities potentially help out by, because they apparently have gotten big revenue here, they can maybe return some of that to homeowners. Well, that's that's another issue that has come up in the hearings and all that. And it was interesting how one auditor said their prosecutor said they couldn't do this, and another auditor said their prosecutor said, oh, yes, you can do this. So one of the things I think we need to do is empower the uh, budget commissions to say, listen, we're not going to let you stockpile tax revenue, you know, because I have entities, you know, told me that, well, hey, I don't have to go to the ballot again for 22 more years because of the money I'm stockpiling and all that. I don't think that's the way it's worked. That that money should stay in the pockets of the taxpayers till the governmental entity needs it. So I, I think there's a there's a way there that if we start to get, you know, a little bit more control on how much uh, revenue we want we want a, a governmental entity to get all the revenue it needs we don't want it to get more than it needs at the expense of the taxpayers and you think it, that some of these governments are getting more than they need right now oh i i'm, I'm aware of some i mean i'm aware having been a county commissioner i'm aware of one entity where where uh, uh, and i'm not going to mention it but it's an entity in the county where uh, the 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 principal operator of it came in and said, "I need you to increase the three tenths of a mill to eight tenths of a mill, and if you do that, I won't. I, I'll be all set for the next 22 years." Uh, and so, uh, in other words, by stockpiling money, basically, uh, you know, I'll always be able to meet my inflationary growth because I'll always have that big reserve there. And and uh, we had we had a little bit of argument about that, but uh, compromised. Uh, Senator Blessing has said one of the biggest problems here is that the housing market is out of whack and housing needs to be dealt with in the property tax question there is just not enough supply to go around and that's driving up costs. So how on earth do you fix that, especially if you're trying to do something fairly yeah. quickly? I, I think that, you know, we just need to, you know, ensure that, you know, we can we can generate more affordable housing in the state of Ohio. Uh, you know, and I think that's one of the problems. I mean, there's quite a little housing going on a development in my area. But, you know, when somebody would look at some of the prices there, they'll say, is this, you know, is this really affordable housing? So I, I think that's that's part of the issue. Uh, but I don't think that's a solution that if we, you know, uh, if we really grow the housing market, it's going to take care of uh, property tax value because we you know we want people once you've made the largest uh, single investment you probably make in your lifetime on a new house you want you want that investment to uh, uh, to inflate in value and all that uh, we just had to somehow say that uh, we ought to make sure that uh, while that inflation is taking place that somehow your property tax burden is protected or modified uh, so that uh, you're not paying commensurate with that increase in value. Are you pushing up against some problems here in terms of Republicans who are in the majority in both the House and Senate have wanted to push for tax cuts? They've wanted to push for things that they believe will bring more business. Does that really come in conflict with some of the things that will help homeowners? Well, it used to and be schools maybe. Yeah, and all I, the other entities. I mean, I was here, I was Ways and Means Chairman 30 years ago here, and I, I had a bill to rein in a lot of these enterprise zones and TIFs and the CRAs, uh, put some limits on them, put some additional conditions on this. And I was told by the then Speaker of the House, uh, Vern Reif, you know, that uh, now we're not going to have this caucus perceived as being anti-economic development. And I said, well, I, I, I would rather we perceived as being pro-tax fairness. Uh, and so, uh, but, but back then, you know, the, the, the whole idea was, oh, we've got to generate more jobs for Ohio. We, 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 can't, we can't stand in the way of creating more jobs. We're having a hard time filling the jobs we have right now. I would rather see if we're going to give a break to 
to, to businesses on their property taxes, I would rather say, just, just don't pay that and improve your bottom line. I would say, no, you pay your property taxes, but we'll give you money back for workforce development uh, because that's really what we need is develop our workforce, uh, not to just uh, do that. But, but again, I think uh, we, we've just got to look at the fact that these trends have taken place that uh, uh, homeowners, and I've seen these tax incentive review committees that uh, are supposed to review these tax abatements, and I've seen them in my area where a company will say we're going to create 50 jobs over the next 10 years, and after three or four years they've created three, uh, and the tax incentive review committee says, well, uh, you haven't kept your promise. They said, "Yeah, we've had a downturn in the economy. Our big, our big, uh, 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 one of our our, our big, uh, uh, you know, uh, demand uh, people that we would supply. They've fallen out of the picture. But we, you know, we still got six years on this. And the tax and zone review committee will say, okay, we'll keep trying. We'll let you keep the tax abatement, all that. Now, as a homeowner, you go into the county treasurer and say, I've had a downturn in my personal economy, uh, and 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 I really am struggling. And uh, could you give me?" a break on my property taxes, that's not going to happen. So I think, that, again, I, I think there's just a, a, a lot of things we have to, but again, I, I think we have to balance this thing out that, that both the local level and the state level, we're all serving the same constituents. And I think we need more of a partnership saying, understanding that if you're going to have to fund a lot of these services locally with property taxes, we from the state government have got to help out. We've got to help out either by paying more of the cost of the service or creating additional circuit breakers for those people who are struggling to pay their property taxes. And that, that's where I think is, is mainly the route we have to go. Plus really take a comprehensive look at all of these tax incentives and tax abatements. I mean, I have a real problem with TIFs, t uh, tax increment financing. So if you vote uh, X amount of mills for developmental disabilities, or you vote X amount of bills for mental health services, or you vote uh, X amount of bills for senior citizens programs, uh, the law right now allows that local government to say, we are going to divert those revenues to paying for water lines and sewer lines and new roadways into this particular development. And, 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 and of course, the courts will say, well, it's legally permissible because the General Assembly allows you to do that. My argument is that, but it's not morally right. If, if people voted money for mental health services or developmental disability services or for some children's services uh, to deal with abused and neglected children, I mean, I just think it's morally wrong that you can take those dollars and say, we are going to tiff them, we're going to... Be you know, their argument is, well, they're, they're still paying the taxes. Uh, 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 you know, the business is still paying the taxes. Yeah, but all the other people, you know, that what about all the dollars that, that are going to be shortchanged in these particular programs? So I think, I think we really need to, I, I really like to reform the whole uh, tax increment financing process. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, this committee was your idea. You'd proposed it last General Assembly, and it got into this budget yeah. as a joint committee. Right. How do you ensure that anything comes out of it rather than just recommendations that uh, sit in a binder somewhere? Well, I, I've been there before. I mean, I, I, I did the... So I'm asking you. <laughs> I did the joint committee on... Uh, but some of the things we did get through from the... Uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Blue Ribbon Committee on Local Government Reform and Collaboration back in 09 and 10. Uh, a little bit more uh, uh, the removal of sections in the in the RIVE code that didn't allow governments to uh, coalesce or work together on particular problems. I, 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 like the, I like the feeling that I'm getting, I'm getting opinions and I'm hearing from both sides of the aisle that are pretty much uh, in sync. I mean, I hear Representative Young and Representative Blessing concerned about the number of property tax abatements. Uh, uh, from uh, Senator Craig and uh, uh, Representative Blessing, uh, or Senator Blessing, regarding uh, the fact that so many seniors are struggling to meet their property tax obligations. So I think there, I think there's a consensus of some of the things we have to address. I, I, I look at the fact that I think we got to rein in these tax abatements, rewrite those. I think we've got to come up with a set of circuit breakers to help our folks who are struggling to pay their property taxes. I think we have to look at uh, possibly empowering the budget commissions at the county if they're not it, don't have the power right now to uh, uh, you know to ride herd on some of these expenditures. Make sure that 
taxes are not levied uh, in excess of what is really needed. And I think we have to look at the number of levies. We have got, you know, renewal levies, replacement levies, emergency levies. We have got, uh, uh, you know, we've got, I, I, I think they are in the double digits, I think. So we really, really need to kind of boil this down, I think, so that people understand, you know, uh, what, what these various things are and uh, just kind of get a handle. Again, I, I thought that probably most of the process of this whole exercise would be Let's learn. Let, let's, let's try and understand how this system that has been built, and it's, to me it's like a house that you know somebody added a back room on, and then they had a little dormer on the top, and they added a shed on the back and all that. And, and we've added all this stuff on, and we have to find out how, how can we coordinate this thing so that you know, it's basically a, a uh, uh, centrally based operation. You can find interviews with Republican Representative Adam Matthews, a sponsor of the bill to eliminate the income tax and the commercial activity tax, and an interview with the chair of the Property Tax Review Joint Committee, Republican Senator Bill Blessing, in our archives.